So we've been talking about purpose, on purpose, in Ephesians. And the first week we talked two weeks ago and we saw what God's purpose was, to gather all things to God through Jesus Christ. That purpose was from the foundation of the world. That purpose is today, right here and right now. And that purpose will be till God's purpose is fulfilled. Last week, we talked about how that, how that unfolds in the world, how that happened, that, that God's purpose came about. And at the end of it, we talked about this. We, we closed with this idea that uh, the understanding that when we work together as God's one body, the purpose unfolds. And today, we're going to talk about church as we study chapter 4 from Ephesians. Did everybody read chapter 3 and 4? Do I have to take a head count? Or are we good? I won't do a test. All right. But we, we, uh, this, week, this week, we're going to talk through chapter 4. Now, chapters 1 through 3, I told you the first week, was, uh, was about theology. And it's rare in letters uh, that are attributed to Paul because Paul writes to churches. But in this letter in Ephesians and the letter to Romans, it's really God first. Writing about God's character, God's plan, God's purpose. That's what chapters 1 through 3 were all about. Today, we begin to put the words to action as we study the purpose of the church on purpose. Let's pray. God, what if it isn't about us, but it's about you? What if the days that we have could be about glorifying you? What if this church was here solely to gather people to Jesus Christ? Teach us how to make that be. Remove from us any fears, any misconceptions, any doubts, and teach us how that can be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the very first thing that we hear is that we understand that the church was part of God's purpose all along. Just as we knew God's purpose was from the foundation of the world, the church had a purpose all along. We go back to chapter 3 or Paul talks about a two-part mission. He starts in chapter 3, verse 8. He says, Although I'm the very least of saints, this grace was given to me to bring the Gentiles the news of boundless riches of Christ. So he was bringing in the outsiders and bringing everyone in. And then it goes on in verse 9 to say, And to make everyone, and that word everyone in Greek is pas, and it's a big all. It's an all, all, all the compassing everyone See what the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. And then verse 10 says, so that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known. And Paul is still teaching us. So he's talking to people in biblical times, but he's talking to us today, he's still revealing that to us today. To the rulers and authorities of high places. And heavenly places, it says in Scripture. This, it goes on in verse 11, was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he has carried out in Christ Jesus' article. So the church was always part of the plan. We messed it up along the way, right? Church? <laughs> but it was always part of the plan. Then Ephesians 4 begins by recognizing that we are called to be true to this purpose. To be part of this plan, to be part of God's plan, to gather everybody together in Christ. We're called to be true to this. Here Paul, or whoever authored this particular letter, is pretty emphatic. I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Pretty emphatic, right? I beg you to lead a life to which you've been called. First, he says it again in 1 Corinthians 7, 17, a different way. Let each of you lead the life that the Lord has assigned, to which God called you. This is my rule in all the churches. Do what God created you for. So it's very clear that we're to be true to that purpose. 
Now, when we start to look at what the church looks like, Ephesians 4.11 says that the, tells us that the church has a purposeful design. And that, that design included leadership. Now, when we read this verse, uh, the, verse 11 says, The gifts he gave us were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. This is God's leadership team. A lot of times when I've read this passage, and maybe you too, it's always been with the spiritual gifts class. This is one of those many places we've gone and found out the different gifts that we are given through God. But this particular reading right here in Ephesians 4 is talking about leadership. The church needs leadership. Some were apostles. Some were prophets. Some were evangelists and some were pastors teachers. Notice it doesn't say he gave these gifts that Tom would be the apostles. Tom would be the prophets. Tom would be the evangelists. And Tom would be the pastor teacher. Leadership is a critical facet in the church's purpose. So there has to be leaders. And it is plural. Did you hear that? Sorry, three of them did. It has to be plural. It, it's what we're called to. Proverbs 11, 14 says, Without good direction, people lose their way. The more wise counsel you follow, the better your chances. The more apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor leaders we have, the more we're going to be smart, aren't we? Yes. Yeah, that's what God's calling us to be, is, is to be following in these leaders that God is putting before us. An apostle means to send out, whenever you hear apostles and talking about send out, they're the idea guys. They're like the person who 35, 40 years ago said, you know what, there's people who are freezing on cold nights, and you know what we should do? We should, we should set up a, a cold night, we should call it a room at the end. That was an apostle that did that. Somebody that saw something that, that God's hand was to be a part of. That's what an apostle would do. They're the ones who always say, I have an idea. Now, they have to help with the idea. That's important, too. <laughs> Prophets speak the truth. And we all need people to speak the truth. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And they, they actually have divine revelation from God. And they are the people that no matter what, if it's wrong, they're going to say, that's not right. Or if it is right, they're going to say, that's right. That's what prophets do in our church, is they're the ones that are going to stand up. And it's not always the pastor that's going to be the one that says, that's not right. Because I'm perfectly capable of fallibility. Do you believe that? Well, yeah, sure, now you speak. Great, great, now you jump in. But yes, it's not always going to be me. But there are people that are called to be that voice, that prophetic voice, that God-inspired voice to say, that's not right, or that is right. And there are times in church where we don't listen to that verse and we are less for it. So we need those people. Next are evangelists. And, and, and evangelists literally means to share the good news. People who can't help but share the good news. Tasha Lavelle, stand up where you are. Stand up. Woo! This yes. is an evangelist yeah. right here. God has gifted her, and many others, by the way, many others that has gifted her so she can not help but talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. Is that true about Tasha? Anybody who ever talks to her knows that's true. That's what we need. That's what leadership in the church is about. It didn't say Tom has to be everywhere. It didn't say the prophets have to, to be up in the front behind the pulpit, did it? And, and there are many places I can't be. I can't be with every small group. I can't be at your place of work. I can't be in your homes. We need apostles. We need prophets. We need evangelists. And we need pastor teachers. We need the people who are going to be the spiritual leaders. And all of those are part of what builds up and makes the church. And what the teacher or spiritual leader, to put it in my own terms, and what that means is, I do what, you know how I say it. I do what God tells me, period. You know, I'm not smart enough to do it on my own. Let me show you how I do that. And that's what I try to do every, every week here and every day of my life. That's what my calling in life is. So 
And so the passage goes on to say, what is the leadership supposed to do? So we've got these people. What are they supposed to do? It says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of Christ. The saints. Do you all know who the saints are? That's you. You all are saints. We're not Catholics, so we all get to be saints. Okay? Good news. Turn to the person to your right and say, you're a saint. Turn the other way. Reconfirm it. Say it again. You're a saint. That's, that's right. We are all saints. Everyone that's part of the body of Christ is a saint in the church. And so what the leaders are to do are to equip those, lead, those saints for the work of ministry. And that's what it's called to do. The, the word equip comes from, I can't pronounce this word, so you'll just have to live with me. It's a Greek word. The, the root word is kartartizo. It means to make perfect. So leaders are to help people. The real translation should be this. Leaders are to bring the best out in the saints for the outbuilding of the church. A good leadership team, what they're about, equips all, pause, for the work of ministry. Matthew 28, 19, we heard Jesus say this as he left us. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Is that the work of the church? Yeah. Yes, it is. The question is, where do we come up short? Well, in Ephesians 4, the next lines make it evident and essential where we must change. We must no longer be children. Now, we talk about children in Scripture, and we hold them lovingly, but this is talking about spiritual maturity. We can't be tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceit scheming by the best thing on television this week, right? We can't be blown about by that. We have, and the question comes up, how do we improve? And in the next verse it says, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Did you hear that? The church, including this church, needs to grow up. Did you hear that? I never read that before, and I've always wanted to tell you people to grow up, and it's great, I get to do it this week. <laughs> Me too. We have to grow up. Bishop Carter, our bishop here in uh, Florida, wrote uh, a study, and I talked about it a couple weeks ago. In his study on Ephesians 4, he said, those are the key words for me, grow up. Sometimes we are in church, we are simply called to grow up. Now, we know how to do this with our children. We expect children to progress, to discover their identities, to blossom and to flourish. And then many would add, we expect them to leave home. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> There's a blog on compellingtruth.org that talks about what the purpose of the church is. It says it pretty well. It says the purpose of the church is to join people of different backgrounds and talents and provide them training and opportunities for God's work. But the purpose of the church is also to grow up. I love this idea. I love this thought. To, and to be the body of Christ for the world. I never thought about that before. I thought about what it means to grow up in Christ for me personally. To mature. To, be, to learn to follow Christ more. But I never realized what Ephesians 4 is talking about is us as a church. We need to grow up. we got to quit being kids. we got to quit being kids about what it's about. And, in, and we've got to move on. We've got to be able to stand up. How do kids talk, man? When we, get, when we don't do church right, we do it just like them. You know, if Andrew and Anthony were here, I could give you a perfect example of what, what we would do. It's Anthony's fault. It's Andrew's fault. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Andrew should do it. Anthony should. Isn't that what we do in the church? Well, that's not my job. I'm not on leadership. That's not what I do. That's not the way it works. Alyssa's here. Alyssa, you really glad I didn't pick on you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point is, the church has to grow up. And we, the way we do that is we grow up in the body of Christ. And then when we grow up in the body of Christ, then we make a difference in this world. Leaders and saints working together to build up the body of Christ. 
1 Corinthians 13, 11. We know that is the love chapter, but this is what it says in there. I, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. So we've got to quit being babies here and grow up. Carter, Bishop Carter continues, how does, how does the church grow up? It becomes more like Jesus, whose roots are deeply sunk in prayer, whose life was invested profoundly in the calling of disciples. That's what Jesus did for full-time work, called disciples, whose heart was with the least, the last, and the lost. This is our mission, too, the mission of Jesus Christ. Amen? First church is stuck. I speak some truth here. I'm going to be a little prophetic. We're stuck, and that's not on purpose. We grow and hit a ceiling. I've been here for eight and a half years, and we this actually is one of our growth periods where we moved up a little bit, but we haven't blown up. And I keep thinking we should be blowing up and, and big things happening, but it hasn't happened yet. And today, I want to heed the call of Paul in 4 1. Today, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your call. I beg you to be part of this church and grow with me. Amen? Amen. Dr. Daniel Brown in ministry today says three critical factors affect the growth of the church. First, he says, a church will rarely grow beyond the capacity of its staff. One thing I know about a staff-driven church is that it robs other people of doing ministry. If the staff runs everything and we just pay somebody to do it, it robs other people from doing the work of ministry, and the church does not grow. Now, I would add to that comment, I think it's, that it's wider than that. I think a church will rarely grow beyond the capacity of its leadership. Because we do have leaders that are involved here. But, but we don't have enough. And we're hitting a ceiling because people are not stepping forward and doing what God's calling them to. The second point he makes is, what fellowship groups exist within the church? But this one pertains to leadership as well. The more leaders we have, the more Bible studies, right? How many people right now are ready to start a Bible study? I knew she was. Good. <laughs> I see one right over there. I see three, four. That's all that we can have Bible studies for. Then. You see, it takes us to have teachers and leaders, and I'm thankful for the people that do stand up and say they'll do it. We need to grow up or we're not going to grow. Amen? Amen? That's what holds us back. Our hands down in our laps. My favorite one of Dr. Brown's is this. How is the responsibility delegated? You see, I could be an iron-fisted pastor that says, All right, everything has to run through me. Has anybody ever heard me say that? I don't think so. No. Or, but the other half that, that I would add to that growth thing is, and what, and what I would add is, how is responsibility claimed? Do you claim responsibility for being a part of this church? Or is that Scott, or is that Andrew, or Anthony's? Is that somebody else's? The, Brown closes with this. Thus, a healthy perspective on church growth leads to God the things that only God can do. The stuff we pray about but willingly assumes responsibility for the things we can do something about. He puts it this way. God gave me the teeth. He gave me, but I brushed them. How many people brushed their teeth this morning? No, you don't have to. <laughs> but here's the point. We need to brush our own teeth, right? Did God give you the teeth to be a part of this church? Yes! Does God call you to brush your teeth? Yes, that's part of the purpose of the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Brothers and sisters, do not be children in your thinking. Rather be infants in evil, but in thinking be adults. That's what God wants us to be. Stephen Cole, another author, wrote, Every Christian knows that we are here to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. 
But how do we do that? We glorify God and enjoy Him by living each day in submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and by using the spiritual gifts that He has given us to extend His kingdom. That's exactly what we're doing. The context for exercising these gifts is in the local church. Anybody tell me where that's at? Right here. Right here. Amen. Where each member works for the growth of the body to build itself in love. This church is hitting a ceiling. And in some ways, it's limited by me. You see, I'm always ready to lead. I get I have to give direction, to make decisions. But when it, it is mine to run, the church is going to be limited by what I can give. I'm only a human. I'm only like the rest of you. You've been with me and watched me with my kids. I'm so excited. Everyone has asked me, sorry, Melissa, can I talk about you for a second? I was, I was so excited the day she got her driver's license. Everyone has asked me, are you worried about her being on the road? Heck no! She can go drive herself now! Praise the Lord! <laughs> and I still have Andrew and Anthony, and, and every day I have shuffling going on, and would you tell me to stop doing that so we grow the church? Would you tell me to be any less of a father? Do we have any nurses? Uh, we just had someone faint in the back. Did anybody go talk to that? Yeah. That'd be great. Equipped 
equipped by the leadership, equipped by the Spirit of God in this place. And as each is working right, the body's growth is building itself up in love. If you think I'm talking about numbers, you're coming to the wrong pastor. I'm talking about lives changed. I don't care about membership. I care about the kingdom comes. And when we grow up together, the kingdom comes. Amen? Amen. So be a part of that. And be a part of what's going on here. Find what God has called you to. Don't be afraid. There's going to be voices speaking to you saying, Oh, no, you could, you're not right for that job. You're not, you can't do that. Yet God is telling you, I created you for this purpose. And God created this, that we would all be knit together for this purpose. Amen. On purpose. Amen? Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.